afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Red X podcast. I'm Tyler Fenn, director of sales with the Red X, uh, and I have Neva Williamson with me in the DC metro area. Neva, thank you so much for being with us today. Hello. Hi. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be awesome. We are going to talk about some really, really cool stuff today. Uh, so uh, for you listeners, whether you're listening on Facebook or YouTube or on our website, thank you for joining us. We're going to spend the next 40 or 45 minutes talking about uh, pre-foreclosures, about short sales, how to make those part of your business. Uh, Neva is is the queen of these uh, of these types of properties and deals. So she's going to educate us a little bit here and help us understand how to make those part of our business. So thank you everybody for joining joining us uh, again. Thank you, Neva, for being with us. So Neva, tell us uh, tell us how you because you've been doing these these types of deals for for almost fifteen years, right? Yeah. So this is this is so you went through the recession. You've gone through really good markets. Tell, give us, just help us understand a little bit more what your experience is like. So you started in 2006 doing real estate investing. Give us, give us the Cliff Notes version of what your careers looked like up until now. Oh, okay. So I started in rentals initially, and then probably about, I think about four years after that, I started doing a lot of wholesaling. And I did wholesaling for a couple of years and um, got into flipping houses, like renovating them and then reselling. And then um, um, I was telling you, I originally, because I used to get a lot of leads that just did not work or they didn't have any equity, like I needed people to have equity to, you know, buy and keep a rental or to um, do a wholesale deal. So a lot of my short sale um what could have been a short sale, I used to just throw away at the time and say, oh, I can't I can't do anything with this. So uh, that's how I got into it is that people were like, oh, you should stop throwing those away. If you get your real estate license, you could do a short sale. So I did that. And originally when I first started doing short sales, they just they take a really, really long time. Like even if you get all the documents on time, you do everything, you call the bank every single day. You know, it just takes a long time. And at the time, real estate investing and wholesaling, I mean, all of that is like really, really fast paced. And I just felt like short sales didn't fit. I just felt like here was all the stuff I was doing really fast and then I would be calling like, okay, did you guys order the BPO? Did you send the loan modification? Like it just was like so opposite. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So I stopped and it was like years later, one of like the top team leads here, he was like, oh, you know, you could really start building that out. You could be like, become an expert. He's like, the, cause at the time the market was actually really, we were, uh, 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 what is it? Like a good market that time. And he was like, the market is going to change. So he was like, if you get into this now, when the market changes, you know, you're, it'll be another thing you can add to your business. So when the market changes and he was right, because the market did change. And then a lot of pre foreclosures and short sales, because even for wholesaling, I need people to have equity. So even in times where the market goes down, it's harder to get wholesale deals. Those are the ones that I can say, okay, you know, we could do a short sale. So it's just another way for me to help people and then, you know, get paid in the end. So and I, and, and I totally agree with what you're saying, right? Like you hustle, hustle, hustle. And then, and then the ball's not in your court anymore. Right. Right? Yeah. So at that point you're yeah. just waiting forever. And, and prior to the show, you'd mentioned that that really turned you off, right? That you were like, yeah. I am not going to do that. Uh, but you've gotten back into it. You 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 spent the time and built the patience to be able to to really turn this into part of your business, uh, and, uh, and that's 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 what I'm excited to talk about. Yeah, whenever people ask me about getting into short sales, because what made me start looking at it different to do it is look at it as you have to build up a pipeline, and once you build a pipeline, you'll start to close one deal a month, two deals a month. So if you look at it that way, then you could kind of stay in the game and have some motivation. Because you know, just starting out, if I'm just having like a face to face with a with a homeowner, we may not close on that for like 12 months, you know. So if I already have that in my mind that hey, I'm just gonna build up a pipeline, and then six months from now, 12 months from now, I'll start to have enough where hey, every month I'm closing something. So then, you know, it, it it's worth it to stay in. But yeah, just starting out, if you're like a new agent and you're just doing short sales you're probably going to quit because you're just like, man, this just takes so long. It's just hard to keep calling the bank over and over and over because you're just like, what are you guys doing with the file? I sent you everything. It's like, it's like <laughs> so, so here's my question, right? We talked about this a little bit before the show is, is 
you get your real estate license and, and they give you the book knowledge to be an agent. And then you show up at the office for your first day of work and they go, okay, let's talk about how to really be an agent, right? right? So it, let's let's say somebody wants to get into short sales. And and uh, and like you said, I think you were really fortunate, right? That somebody, somebody kind of said, hey, learn this now because in a little while it's going to be valuable. Yeah. I think that we're, we're kind of facing that right now. I, I, I mean, there, there's a possibility with everything happening in the country right now with, with COVID and businesses shutting down and all of that, that people, we, we may see short sales start to become a, a bigger thing than they have in the past few years. So how does somebody start to do this in the business, to learn that, that real knowledge, right? Uh, um, where, where would you recommend that somebody go to get started to turn short sales into something in their business? Oh, um, let me see. Cause I'm trying to think, what did I do when I first started? Probably go to somebody else that's maybe doing short sales to see if maybe they're willing to share the information. Um, relationships are really good because for me, like I'm the first person in my family to really be an entrepreneur, the first person to really be in a real estate. So it's really good to build relationships because if I didn't have at the time it was Rob Chavez, big up to him to say, Hey, you, you should have throw those leads away, you know? Um, so you got to build relationships and networks with people that are, you know, if they've been in the business 10, 20 years, those are the people you want to reach out to because they know, you know, they're the ones that know, hey, just because we're in a good market now, set yourself up so that if, when the market goes down, what are you going to do? Like when you can't find a wholesale deal, what are you going to do? So those are the things that you need to think of being an entrepreneur. You can't just have only one investing strategy because. What, what are you going to do when you can't find houses to flip? Because like now it, it's harder to find houses to flip because everybody and your mother are out saying that they're a house flipper. So like when I first started, it was way easier for me to get deals. Now I go to houses, there's like 20, 30 other people walking through the house, putting in a bid. So it's important one to go out to, I tell people you need to go out to your local market to like those real estate meetings and you have to meet people that are actually doing deals in that market because like I'm here in Virginia in the DC area, but you could be someplace completely different and the market could just be different. So you just need to know what is going on in your market. Like, and if you, when you go out to meet people in your market, that's how you're going to get all your networking. That's what people, like people will tell me, Hey, this is, this is who I use for a short sale negotiator. So then you can reach out to that person and say, Hey, I'm doing short sales. I need a short, like now I have a professional short sale negotiator, but that was a, a top agent gave me that lead and said, Hey, this is who I use. So you need that because a lot of people that I work with, they're not over, um, like all over social media blasting saying, I'm the top short sale negotiator. They're so busy working. They're not even really on social media like that. So you need to know, basically, especially as a real estate agent, real estate agents are focused on getting to the closing table. So if we give you a referral, then I that you know that's somebody that's closing deals as opposed to like I get emails all the time because people find my information online and they're like, oh, I'm a short sale negotiator. I would like to do business with you, but I don't really, I don't really trust that because I need somebody that's closing the deal, and I want to get a referral from another agent that's like, "Hey, I've used him, and we've closed twenty deals together." I don't want to be the first person, and you're practicing with me. So, like, so you really got to get out and meet people in your market that are doing short sales. You need to get out, talk to like bankruptcy lawyers, divorce lawyers, like. All those people, like it's like it's all intertwined. They, they, that these are the people you need to know. You need to be going to the courthouse, right? All those people that are going to the courthouse to file bankruptcy that don't have lawyers yet because all they did was scrape together money to file bankruptcy. You need to go there and you need to be able to get leads from that. So it's just like you got to just get out in your local market, and that's how you can start building and really learning what really happens in your market. So that's 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 an excellent answer for for the education, right? Is to, is to go out, st don't be afraid to ask questions and start start building the relationships, and then and then and, and and simply gain that knowledge just by getting out there and getting to know the people that are already doing it. So here, I I do have a couple of questions here as we surveyed our our listeners. Some of the people answer they asked some of the questions that they want to know about short sales. So can we answer some of those? Okay. If that's all right with you, okay. Yeah, so sure. the, one of the top questions here is what is the best way to start landing face-to-face -face meetings with homeowners that are in the foreclosure process? 
Well, what I do, which is a, a well, I'll tell you a couple of the ways that I do it. I do, okay. I get the first thing is you want to get a list that of people that are in pre foreclosure. So either you have to buy that list or um, like I buy it, um, and that's how I get and know who's late. Um, what I usually tell people is you want to get people that are at least 90 days late because I, in my experience, people that are 30 and 60 days late, a lot of times they figure out a way to catch up. You know, they okay. borrow they borrow the money or something like that. But 90 days late, usually two things happen there. One, the bank will only accept a payment if you pay all of the arrears, if you're, if you're 90 days late. So usually people that are three months behind, they don't have three months to pay. And then the bank stops accepting partial payments. Like say you, if you're 90 days late and you send in a monthly payment, the bank, just, they send it back. They're like, you gotta pay 90 days and bring the loan current. So that's when people start getting, and then the bank starts adding lawyer fees. Like, so that's when people really start getting in trouble. And then the clock is also starting for the house to go in the foreclosure to get an auction letter. I usually say you need to get a list I say get a list where people are at least 90 days late because that's usually when people are like, I got to figure something out. I got to do something or this house is going to foreclose. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So you said you said there's a couple of ways. So the first is get a list of them that, that where they're at least 90 days late. Yeah. And then um, the other thing is I get leads from bankruptcy attorneys. So you can go out and get relationships with bankruptcy attorneys. The reason is that a lot of times people file bankruptcy, it stops the auction, but then they still cannot reinstate that loan to keep the house. So the auction is stopped, but once that bankruptcy file closes, the house will go in foreclosure. So usually a bankruptcy lawyer will refer them to do a short sale. So if you have a relationship with a bankruptcy attorney that, hey, when you get clients that um, they need to do a short sale, you know, refer me. And the way you can make a relationship is a lot of times, like I meet people like from my list, um, they're like, oh, I don't want to sell. I don't want to do this. You know, they're like, no, I, I, I'm trying to keep the house. And I'm like, I give them all their options. And I'm like, the only thing that's going to help you at this point, because sometimes people call me and their auction is the next day. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, the, honestly, I'm like, the only thing you could do is, is file bankruptcy. So the way I have a relationship with bankruptcy attorneys is that I will refer and say, look, th their auction is the next day. The only thing that's going to help them is if they file bankruptcy. So it's like a win-win. I'll refer people when I can't help them because it's just they call me too late. I'll refer them to the bankruptcy attorney and then the bankruptcy attorney in turn, they can refer me when they have a client that needs to do a short sale. So those are like the two top ways that, that I get leads and get in front of people that I know are in trouble. They're probably going to be in some type of pre foreclosure status. So now you, you mentioned, you mentioned that sometimes people call you, how often are people reaching out to you because they've, they've been referred to you versus you calling on those lists of, of, late of late payment well the the list that i buy what i do is i'm i, I mail a letter okay a letter so there are people that are, people that are calling me are responding to my letter gotcha so I, do, I do three contacts with the people on my list i send okay. them a letter um i go to their house and i door knock and then i also um try to call um just so many different places now you can get their phone number their cell phone or something so i'll try to call send a text message so i try to find three ways to contact that person because a lot of times the thing with pre foreclosure sometimes people have already left the house because they just give up or they move to somebody else's house because they think they're going to lose the house so sometimes it's hard to get in contact with people are late on their mortgage. So that's why I'm trying to call. I'm trying to send a letter because the letter, sometimes at least they'll have their mail forwarded. And then right. the reason I'm still not getting a call. The reason I go to the house is a lot of times when I go to people's houses that are late on their mortgage, the, there's so much mail piled up. They just haven't gotten to my letter to even open it. So that's why gotcha. I still tell people that that's why I still door knock because you could send 
people that are in distress. You can send them 10 letters and they've never even opened it because their mail just, you know, there's so much stuff going on in their life that they don't get through all their mail to even get your phone number. So that's why sometimes the letter I sent is from three weeks ago and they're calling me the day before the auction. Like, oh, I just opened the letter. I'm like, what the, <laughs> I'm like, I can't help you if the auction is tomorrow. So, so, so I, I, that, that's, that's fantastic. And I, and I love this and I want to spend a little more t talking about this. Cause so, so you said you mail them a letter, you knock the door and you call them, right? Yeah. So you're doing, you're doing these three different approaches. Now is, is there, is there like a process like on day one, you're going to send a letter. If they don't respond within two days, you're going to go knock the door or is it, or is it, I'm just going to do all three as quickly as I can to try to get in touch with these people. Well, everybody gets everybody gets a letter. Everybody gets a letter. I send everybody a letter. Now okay. I can start seeing um, the people that I'm definitely or call or if I can see that their auction date is coming up. So here in Virginia, usually I could start seeing the auction date about I think about 30 days out at least. I start to see it. So if I start seeing that the the list where I'm, they definitely have an auction scheduled. I'm definitely going to the house and I'm definitely calling because I'm like, you have to do something because I'm usually at that point calling and saying, hey, I see that you have an auction scheduled, you know, June 30th, you know, you need to call me, you know, you have options, but I can only help you if you call me, you know, before the auction. So once, if I see they have an auction date, then those are the people that I'm really trying to be aggressive because the time to help them is, you know, I can, I can only help them before the auction. Like, if the, if the house goes to auction here, that's it. It's a wrap. There's nothing that I can do. Um, so I'm always trying to, if I see the auction date, say, hey, you have to call me. I can only help you before the auction date. So so you're using that to create some urgency for these people. I mean, obviously there's urgency yeah. in their life, but you're using that as the urgency to say, you have to call me yeah. sooner than later, right? Because- yeah. Because yeah. otherwise I can't help you. Yeah, otherwise I'm, yeah, because, and I have that. I have people call me the day of the auction. I'm like, then that's how, like I said, once you start doing this, you start to learn because if you call me, when I first started, if you call me the day before the auction, I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you, it's too late. Then I started learning, oh, a bankruptcy attorney can help them the day before the auction. So that's when, I, like I'm saying, once you start really getting out there and communicating with other people, you know, it's another agent that told me, hey, no, if, you, if they file bankruptcy, you could stop it, then do the short sale. So I was like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. I was just telling them it's, it's too bad, <laughs> it's too late. You know, so that's why I started going out and then making connections with bankruptcy attorneys and saying, hey, you know, I'm getting these leads and sometimes they call me a day before the auction, and I know their only option is to file bankruptcy. I can, you know, refer the lead. So I, I would imagine that these conversations are sometimes pretty. I mean, there's a lot of high emotions for these people. Is that is that fair, right? I mean, is, is, <laughs> <laughs> so so I mean, how how much time do you spend on these conversations to to you know be empathetic, but at the same time still be professional and respect your own time? Of, of being productive. How do you find that balance between, you know, being a shoulder to cry on and yet a, a professional resource at the same time? Right. And that's the thing. When I first started, that's one of the things I used to be like, with a short sale is that the bank requires so much documentation. And so then I have to tell people, this is a bad situation. But all this paperwork, I need you to calm down and get all of it because if the package is not a hundred percent complete the bank is not gonna they're not gonna process this so it's one minute being like really really nice and empathetic and the next minute being like you got to get me this by I close the business today or i can't help you or the house is gonna foreclose so sometimes i'm being a nice person but honestly sometimes i'm being very mean i'm like i'm just you you know i just have to be honest and say if we don't get this in today because the thing is the short sale process is the same loan modification package that you have to submit. And what happens is some banks, they'll say, they'll have a deadline. They'll say, we'll own paperwork or your house will foreclose. So you do sometimes you have to be sympathetic, but then you also have to tell them, like, if, if we don't meet the deadline, I can't help you. Because what I tell people is with a short sale, 
Me too. We're at the mercy of the bank. With the short sale, a bank controls the entire process. If the bank decides to reject that package, that's it. There's really nothing else that we can do. So that's why I'll review the package first and make sure it's complete and all that because I know that we're at the mercy. It's all about what the bank says with a short sale. It's not like when you're selling a traditional house and you're just negotiating with the seller and you could, you know, change because it's almost like sometimes like the bank doesn't want to bother. And if they find one tiny thing missing with that package, they just throw the whole package out. And then, and then if you, and then if you, like I said, or be past that deadline, you cannot submit, they will not accept the package. And, and then you just cannot do a short sale. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to a couple of the questions that we've had from some of our listeners, Amanda Smith in Texas. She asked this question. She says, do you recommend that newer agents acquire a designation in foreclosures or short sales before engaging in these transactions? I think that that's definitely going to help because it's, you have to learn all that. Like, because a lot of times, like traditional agents, like I was on a team before and I was the only one doing distressed sales. And these were like top agents and they have a clue because they never come across the things that you come across in the distressed market. So a lot of times if something, if, even though they're top agents, they're killing it. If they come across something, you know, they would have to call me and be like, Oh, I have this, you know, this person they're behind. What are their options? Like they have no idea because they specialize in a particular niche. And then if they just meet somebody that's like, Oh, I'm behind. They're like, Oh, I don't even know what your options are. So then, so you have to learn this. You have to learn this niche because a lot, it's just a lot of different dynamics. You need to know the deadlines. You need to know things to adhere to. So I definitely would recommend that you take as much training as you can because it's, it's definitely a very unique niche. Well, and it sounds like you're recommending formal and informal education, right? Get out there, get the training and take the courses and at the same time, you just got to hustle and and, yeah. and learn by experience because that's what's going to build the skill to get you to where you want to be. But once once you have that skill, I mean, look how valuable and, and, and that can be in your business, especially if the markets do turn. Uh, it, 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 we mentioned that this is kind of an emotional sale and it sounds like uh, or is an emotional conversation, but it sounds like, yes, you try to be empathetic, but but then you've got to kind of be the tough love. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you go, okay, look, I know you're upset, but there's a deadline here and it's got to be done perfect. Otherwise it's, it's just a big waste of everybody's time. That, and that's just be what it is. It's just going to be a waste because I, you know, I, I don't own the bank. I'm like, okay, you know, this is literally, I'm telling you, this is an option, but if you don't do what you need to do, it's not going to happen. And then here in my market, you know, Usually the people that I, my clients are usually people that never thought they would be in this situation. So they're like well-educated. Um, they had high incomes and things like that. So something happened and that's why some other really, really stressful situation happened. That's why they're in this, you know, this situation anyway. So, you know, I've had stuff, it's like, you know, divorce or, um, you know, it's usually stuff like that. There's something else. Somebody was sick. Their child had can't like, it's just something that they're already stressed out and then they just focused on that issue and then now they're like crap that we're behind on the house and so they're just already stressed out and then of course when people are stressed out you're going to see like the worst of people so sometimes yeah. like you know, people may start yelling at me i'm like look i'm just trying to help you if you don't want my help i'll, I'll get up and leave so that's what i'm saying in the beginning i used to try to be nice but then i'm like okay you're you're a grown adult and bad things happen to everybody is you have to decide, do you want to get out this situation and be able to start over or you can let the house foreclose and just be in a worse situation. It's up to you. So you do have to start to get tough with them because a lot of times, you know, people just want to cry all day or sometimes I have stuff, especially with divorces where I need them both to sign and they're not even talking to each other. You know, it may be something like that where they're like, you know, I've had it where, they have equity in the house and the wife is like, I'm not signing. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, you're going to lose the equity. And they're like, well, I don't care. You don't know what he did to me. I'm like, look, <laughs> it's like, if you don't sign this, cause I need both of them to sign. So sometimes it's that trying to get two people that hate each other to work on 
the deal so we could actually, you know, get to closing or get this packet submitted because they're so busy arguing, you know, they just want, and that's the thing too, a lot of times people just want you to hear their side. So I'll listen for a while and then I'm like, okay, I need you to sign so we could get moving or you're never gonna, you're gonna lose all your money. And cause the, the, the main thing I try to tell people is this is a, a way to start over because if the short sale does not get approved, then the next option is foreclosure. So then you're going to be in a worse situation if your house goes into foreclosure. So this is like a short sale is like your last resort to try to save your credit, to try to walk away, not own the bank, not having a deficiency judgment. Like a short sale is literally your last option to at least walk away. Cause with a short sale, you could buy a house. You could build your credit, buy a house two years later. A foreclosure is going to take you five, seven years before you can get a loan again to buy a house. So like a short sale, this is your last chance to, you know, just be an adult about it and get this document in and be able to start over. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. I think that for a lot of people and a lot of people just don't know that. Right. I mean, as you have conversations with people, that's like new knowledge and new information for them. Right. Oh, yeah, because a lot of times especially like in divorces, that's what happens. Like I said, it's too high income. You know, I'm talking, I'm in houses that, you know, the income $400,000, but if one person leaves, now they can't afford it. And to get back at the other spouse, the person may say, oh, well, let the house foreclose. And they think that the house is going to foreclose and that's going to be the end of their problems. And I have to tell them, no, if you're, when your house forecloses, you still bank the different thousand and you don't even have a house. So there are some people like, oh, wait, hold on. That's why I'm like, do you really hate him that much that you want to be stuck with this deficiency judgment? Or do you want to do the short sale and we negotiate and get that judgment and get that negotiated so you, you walk away and you don't owe that money? So that's what I try to explain to people. This is this is your last chance. Because if we, if we don't meet the deadline and you submit the paperwork late, your house is going to foreclose. And then I guess y'all could fight over who's going to pay the deficiency judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So here's a question that we get really, really commonly is how do you start to build relationship with the banks, right? Who, who, who's the person that you got to call? Who's the person that you're going to hound over and over and over? How do you start to build those relationships? Well, to, to, to get, cause you're saying to be the agent that the bank refers. Uh, yeah. Or once you're, once you're submitting that file to the bank or to the lender, how do you continue to follow up with that and build those relationships to make sure that you're calling the right person at the right time to, to make yeah. sure that the process continues? Well, usually now when this first started and we were um, like years ago, when this first started, the banks were so overwhelmed, they didn't even have an office set up for this. So you would call and it would just be random people sometimes you get you know you would just for that one file you're talking to like 10 different people and i used to tell people i used to have to write down who i spoke to what time blah 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 now most banks you um they're gonna assign that file to someone and usually that's gonna be like the counselor that's gonna walk that file all the way through so most banks are set up that way now but initially yeah years ago when short sales when the bank when the house that i guess like 2008 2009 you would just, you can speak to like 50 people before you get that short sale out because it would just go to whoever picks up the phone. Um, when people talk about like building relationships with the bank, one of the things I also do is like now, like in my area, auctions are, they're all stopped. But what I do now is I help people that are looking to do a loan modification. So the, the, the thing is, it's a good way to build a relationship with the bank because you're already involved when the person is submitting for that loan modification because the loan modification package and the short sale package are the same package. So if you get involved and help them submit their loan modification, you're already building a relationship. You're already talking to that same counselor. And then when if someone gets denied for their loan modification, the next option, the bank is going to tell them, oh, your next option is you can do a short sale. So if you already were involved in helping them with the loan modification, then the bank already knows you have an agent. And I'll tell my clients, you know, they actually tell them you already have an agent. But if they've already gone through the loan modification and you were not involved, when they get to that stage, 
the bank is going to tell them your next option is a short sale. And then the bank will refer them to a real estate agent. So that's when now you're going to be competing to get that listing when you could have just had it because the loan modification process is long too. So by the time if somebody gets denied for a loan modification, they've already been working with, working with me for a couple months. So they just say, oh, I already have an agent. They're not going to switch after we've been doing this for six months. So they'll tell, they'll tell the bank, oh, I already have an agent. Even if they get a referral, they'll say, I already have an agent. So that's another way that you can build relationships because they already know you already have all these people you've been doing loan mods for. You you know, they just will know already. Got it. That's, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. And, and uh, so, you, I mean, you started this in 2006 through the recession. Uh, were you doing short sales through through the recession, 2008, 2009, 2010? No, I wasn't you, doing You were sales. still doing rentals and, and, and yeah. flips at that point. Yeah, I was doing that. I did start doing loan modifications back then. So I was doing a lot of um, loan modifications for myself, for my properties, and I was helping people get their loan modifications in. So that helps you too with short sales because, like I said, it's the same process basically to do a loan mod yeah. and to do a short sale. So, so – Doing it now might even be easier than it used to in the past because the banks will assign somebody to that file. You get the same person over and over. And it's not like you need to build a personal relationship with the banks like you used to. It's it's they've got departments and people and employees yeah. at the bank to handle those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. There's somebody assigned already. Like, but like I said, when we first started doing low mods, it was just I would tell people when you call, write down who you spoke to in the time, because it would just be just whoever picked up the phone. But now most banks, yeah, they assign somebody and that person is going to walk through the file. And if something's missing, you know, I make sure like as soon as that, that file or they respond, I always send them my contact information so that if something's missing in the file, they know to email me, call me so I can get right on it and stuff like that. So usually, you know, it's just one person that, you know, unless something happens, they quit or something. It's usually just one person. So well, the, the, well, some banks, you can actually go to their website and you can like apply to be like a referred agent to help with short sales. You could go on their website and, yeah, and fill out the paperwork. Gotcha. Thank you for that. So here's another one of the questions that we that we got when we surveyed our our, uh, our listeners. It says, what are the biggest struggles you face dealing with a pre-foreclosure transaction or a short sale transaction? And, and how does that differ from a traditional transaction? Uh, okay. It's a couple things that are difficult. <laughs> uh, one of them is that the bank will order um, a BPO, um, like an appraisal. And okay. this is a, this is such a pet peeve for me because what has happened over the years is that it's like, well, one of the reasons is the bank has like reduced how much they pay for these BPOs. So nowadays, honestly, when the bank gets orders, these BPOs, a lot of these, a lot of these appraisers, they don't even go inside the house. They literally look online and they try to do, because it because they're not getting paid as much as they used to, to do the BPO. So they're just trying to get through as many as possible and not spend a lot of time on it. Then they're not trying to go in, drive there, walk through the house. So the reason why that ends up being such a hindrance is they want to look online, look at the pictures, and then they send the BPO in. The problem is a lot of times what they do is they just use sales that are around the area that are comparable, but those houses are usually traditional sales where the house is nice and pretty. And so that house might've sold for $500,000. A short sale, you know, this is somebody they have not been taking care of the house. So the house most likely needs repairs. And so if you don't go inside the house to see the actual condition, a lot of times the BPO comes back too high and the bank uses the BPO to figure out what value they'll accept for the short sale. So like say the BPO comes back at 500,000, the bank may say, okay, we're going to accept 90% of the BPO or something like that. Well, if he, if the BPO is already too high, then my short sale offer is all, you know, I can't get a short sale offer. I'm like, this is, this is too high. Like this house is not worth this. So then I have to go and, you know, submit pictures, submit repair estimates because, but so a lot of times, like when they order BPO, I'll try to tell the appraiser, Oh, I'll meet you there. 
because I want to make sure they go in the house. But a lot of them, they still know that's what I'm trying to do. So they'll be, they, they try to, they'll make the appointment and then they'll call me. Oh, you know what? My other appointment ended early. So I just came early. I already did the beat. You know, so they, I know what they're doing is they're trying to get around going inside. The, I'm like, I know what you're trying to do. So that's one of the biggest things is that if they, if the BPO comes back too high, it just messes up the numbers for me to get the short sale approved. So that's, and so that's one of the things that really gets on my last nerves because, and the other thing is that they don't factor in for the BPO that it's a short sale. Meaning when you do a short sale, you can't like have like any repairs, right? You buy a traditional house, you get an inspection, you can, you know, you can ask the seller to fix things. A short sale is just an as is sale. So the house is not going to sell, even if it's an excellent condition. It's not going to, somebody's not going to pay an as is price when you also have to do all the repairs. And also they have to wait so long. Like people, why would I, I could buy the house next door, close in 30 days. Why am I going to buy this house and wait six months? They want some type of discount for waiting that long. So that's like one of the biggest things is that the BPO is another thing that's out of my hands. So when the BPO comes back too high, I have to like go back and tell the bank, I would I already know the beat, this is too high. Um, so what I'll try to do is like, go and take more detailed pictures. I'll say, look, there's water damage on this floor. This is the repair estimate for that and stuff. But even still, it just makes the process take longer because I know what it is. This, the, most likely the appraiser never went inside the house. He just went online, went on Zillow or something, put in the BPO and sent it off. So is, is there a way, I mean, let's say the BPO comes back and you're trying to fight that to show, like you said, you submit repair pictures and estimates and things like that. Um, could, do, do you also ever submit a previous appraisal or, uh, I mean. No, because that's the thing. The bank will only accept the BPO from the appraiser that they sent. So even if I, even if, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why <laughs> I just want to shake somebody. I'm like, because I mean, I've had the short sale delayed because, I've had the appraiser call me and say, oh, I'm going on vacation. I can't do the BPO. And I'm like, okay, can I go do the BPO? Because I'm here. I could go do the BPO. Because that's, you know, it's just all these delays. And then they're like, okay, well, I'll tell the bank to assign it to somebody else. And then it takes weeks for them to do that. So, and that's the thing. We'll be like, hey, I have somebody that can do the BPO. And they'll say no. They will always take the BPO from their assigned, whoever they assign is who needs to do that. They will not accept it from anyone else. And so that's like just one of the things sometimes that's just, it's just so annoying because I'm like, Ugh, it just makes the process look, take so long. Yeah, that does seem frustrating because, you know, even in a traditional sale, if the appraisal comes back, you know, at a price that's really unexpected, you, you know, you could have a second appraisal done or you can, you can appeal that. I mean, it seems a lot easier in a traditional transaction when the when the appraisal comes back at a price you don't like than it does yeah. where, where this just seems like you said it's totally out of my hands you have yeah. no control well, I mean, a tra when i do traditional sales i when i do traditional sales um those appraisers are not doing this because that's what i'm saying this is because it's kind of bad maybe the banks don't realize it the appraiser is only doing that because it's the bank because when you're a traditional right. sale that is who have to appraise this house they're not going to go on zillow look at pictures right. and send you over they're going to go they're going to meet you there they're going to walk through the house they're going to be there for at least an hour so it's different but it, because it's a bank it's just a numbers game they're just trying to yeah. do like oh i could do 10 i know people that are like oh i do 10 12 15 bpos a day uh, an, an appraiser is there's no way you can talk to an appraiser and he's telling you he's doing that many a day so that tells you they're not the one they're not going to the house or they just do like a drive by of the house. So that's what I'm saying. They're not doing when it's a, a bank order BPO, they're not doing a detail. They're just not. They're just trying to get as many done as possible. I, I can feel your frustration. <laughs> like <laughs> like as, I, as you're sitting here talking about it, I'm going, that would really annoy me like that, yeah. that. I totally can see what you're what you're what you're what you're saying and how frustrating that would be. So we've we've talked about some awesome stuff. We talked about um, about how to get out there and start building the relationships with people, right? You mentioned divorce and bankruptcy attorneys. 
um, how to how to learn how to get better. You mentioned, look, t- take the formal training, take the informal training. Both of those are valuable. Get a designation if that works. At the same time, mm-hmm. you, you know, watch other people, ask lots of questions, and then just get in and do it. Um, and then, and, and we've talked about a few other really neat things. What are some of the other really big things that somebody would need to know as they try to get into this? What are some of the other frustrations or hurdles that you've had to overcome that 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 maybe you can help set an expectation for people who who are who are going to start gaining this knowledge and experience? Like, what are the things you wish you'd known before jumping into all of this and making this a big part of your of your business? Uh, let me see what I wish I'd known before. Well, probably one of the things that I notice, um, even in mentoring people sometimes is people do not keep up with their marketing. If you're not consistent with your marketing or whatever method you're using to get leads that you just cannot be successful. So meaning you can't get busy with a transaction because I'm yelling at this BPO guy that I don't go and get my postcards out. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you gotta be like, you. no matter what happens, you have to have a schedule. Hey, on Mondays, I download the new list. These are the new leads. Tuesday, these letters go out. Wednesday, I'm trying to get the phone number. Like, you have to be so on top of getting those leads um, because you gotta follow up. Because a lot of times, one of the biggest misconceptions is people think that, oh, these people are late. And they think that you're just going to send one letter and everybody's going to be calling you. So a lot of times people think that because people are in pre-foreclosure and need help, they don't have to market. They don't have to follow up. But it's just like traditional sales. You have to follow up 10, 15 times before people, you know, it seems crazy because you're thinking you're behind on your mortgage. You need help. And I'm telling you, I can help you. But that people just don't pick up the phone. They keep putting it off. They keep trying to come up with the money. So you have to follow up just like how a traditional agent would that would tell you, hey, I'm out here. I'm walking my um, my farm. You know, it's the same thing. You have to, if you're going to pick this niche, you have to study it. Like right now, I'm studying what, what is in the CARES Act. What, what does it say? What are people's options? Because if I can't tell people what their options are, then I can't help. If they call me and say, oh, the bank told me this, the bank told me that, then I have, I don't want to depend on, you know, what they're telling me, especially because a lot of people, they're not even going to communicate with the bank because they're scared, they're nervous, so they don't even know what their options are. So that's what I do. A lot of times it's just, I get a lot of leads because I'm educating people on, hey, this is the option. Like some people are like, oh, I'm taking a forbearance. I'm like, a lot of times people take forbearance and they don't realize that when the forbearance ends, you have to pay all of the arrears. And then they're like, what? And I'm like, send me the letter that they sent you. And I'll read it through and I'll say this section right here in the fine print, when your forbearance ends in August, you need to have five months of payments. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't know. So I've had people that reached out to me that went back and canceled their forbearance because they're like, oh, I didn't know that's how the forbearance was going to work. So you have to really stay and know this niche. You can't just think that because people are behind on their mortgage, they're going to work with you because you show up. You have to show that it's still a house and their biggest investment. They're stressed out. You have to show them that you're an expert so that they trust you, that you're going to walk them through this process. Because this is, like I said, this is their last resort. If you don't get this short sale approved, your house will go into foreclosure. That, that's such fantastic advice, and and with a lot of the other agents that we've had on this podcast, right? That that seems to be kind of an underlying theme is you have to have a process in place to manage your leads, and 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 and, and like you said, it doesn't matter that they're about to foreclose; they still aren't gonna aren't gonna pick up the phone and call you. You yeah. have to be the one to still initiate the initiate the transaction. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. People usually think that I don't market. And, you know, so sometimes people, I've had people like that are way bigger companies than me that have gone to my website, filled it out, and I call. They're like, oh, this is such and such. And I'm like, this like, they're like, oh, we were just trying to figure out what are you doing that you're getting all these leads? And I'm like, 
You know, I'm like, what? You know, so I'm like surprised. But that's the thing. I, the one thing I would say I've really done, I always keep up on my marketing because if you let that let, if I skip a week or two, I could tell I get less phone calls. I guess that I could I could immediately see. Like if I just skip sending out postcards or skip sending out letters, I could feel it because I could feel the volume of the calls and the responses. It immediately goes down. So you got to, even if you get busy closing deals, you have to keep your marketing up. And like I said, you got to stay like, because of what's going on now, you got to stay up to date on what are the new regulations that are coming out? What are they saying the options are? What is, you know, you have to know all that stuff. I, I love that. Thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for taking time to be with us. Uh, there's, there's some amazing things that you've, that you've taught us today that, that I think a lot of agents who want to get into short sales, this is a fantastic place for them to start. To start. So thank you so much. Uh, if you'll hang out with us for a few minutes after the show, you and I will go over a few things, but thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, for all of you listening, thank you for being with us. For you regulars who are, are listening on the show every, uh, every day that we have it, thank you for being with us. Uh, if you're new to listening to the show, uh, we do podcasts like this every single week, th usually three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1.30 Mountain Time. And we're trying to interview people who are fantastic at what they do so that we can take what they do and teach that to uh, to those of you who are listening. Um, if you want to get updates to this podcast, please go to our website, theredx.com. Click on podcast on, in, in the link and uh, you'll be able to subscribe to the uh, the list to get updates for this. Uh, another great place to go is our, our customer forum. So if you're a Red X customer, log into your uh, Red X platform, Vortex, and you'll be able to uh, see the forum in the upper right-hand corner there. Uh, thank you so much again, Neva, for being with us. This is awesome. We would love to have you back and hear how things are going. Thank you. And uh, everybody else, we'll see you Wednesday at 1.30 Mountain Time.